Hello, everyone joining us around the world, and welcome to our Distinguished Lecturer webinar series. Before we go any further, my name is Terry Cosby, and I'm the Chapters Manager here at the IEEE Computer Society. I oversee our more than 500 professional and student chapters around the world and manage our Distinguished Visitors Program. Before we get started, I'd like to get a couple of housekeeping tasks out of the way. You can ask your questions in the Q&A panel. Dr. Murugasan will answer as many questions as he can following his presentation. The webinar is being recorded, and the slides and recording will be made available within a few days after the webinar. Today's lecture will examine how IT has helped us face the challenges created by the COVID-19 pandemic. Today's speaker is Dr. Sam Morgison, Director of Bright Professional Services and Adjunct Professor in the School of Computing and Mathematics at Western Sydney University, Australia. He's former Editor-in-Chief of the IEEE CS IT Professional Magazine. He has vast experience in both industry and academia, and his experience and interests span a range of areas. He is co-editor of the Encyclopedia of Cloud Computing and Harnessing Green IT Principles and Practices. He served as Senior Research Fellow at the NASA Ames Research Center in California and as Professor of Computer Science at Southern Cross University in Australia. Prior to these, he worked at the Indian Space Agency in Bangalore, directing several projects. This webinar is co-hosted by the Special Technical Community IT in Practice. Dr. Murugasan, thank you for presenting today. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Kerry. Hello, I take pleasure in welcoming you to this webinar. Thanks for your participation. First, I would like to thank Mr. Kerry Cosby and his team for nicely introducing me and for organizing this seminar. And also, I'd like to thank IEEE Computer Society for initiating this uh, new series, Distinguished Lecture Webinar, and supporting this. As Kerry has pointed out, in this webinar, I will outline how IT is helping and supporting us in the fight against COVID pandemic. And also, I will uh, briefly discuss what lessons we can learn from this pandemic, particularly in the context of computing IT. As we all uh, recognize and face, we are now facing the deepest crisis of our time. The coronavirus disease called COVID, and which some people like to call it just C19, uh, this has nothing to do with the programming language C. This is coronavirus 19, has caused not only the global health crisis, but also caused major crises in other areas. For instance, it disrupted the business and industry, triggered a social upheaval, and affected economy and life and work worldwide. It is not a local crisis, it is a worldwide crisis. In short, COVID has devastated life and livelihoods of people across the globe. It has caused untold human sufferings and halted societies, industries, transport, and the economies around the world. Nevertheless, some aspects of life and livelihood must continue without much disturbance. And we are collectively must do what we can do to address this crisis. In fact, we are fighting an invisible enemy, COVID-19. Let us look at how we are managing and fighting the COVID crisis, in the, particularly in embracing technological advancements in these difficult times. So this pandemic is not the first one, and it will not be the last one as well. We had several pandemics in the past, as you'd see, in this slide, hope you are able to see my slide. I... I just said, let me see this thing, whether you are able to see the slide, the earlier pandemics.
the slides can be seen. Okay. Kerry, can you see the slide earlier pandemics on the audience screen? Yes, all of the slides are seen. There's no problem. Okay, thank you. So as seen in this slide, uh, we had a major, uh, say, pandemic about 100 years ago, that is the Spanish flu, and followed by Asian flu, Hong Kong flu, and more recently, swine flu pandemic. Of all this, the Spanish flu has been very severe, it infected about 500 million people, and uh, almost one, uh, say, tenth of that, about 50 million people died. So all these pandemics have devastated the humanity and changed the course of history irrevocably. Then the question arises, what is the difference between these pandemics and the pandemics we had earlier? The main difference is the deadly nature of the virus and also the speed at which it is spreading. And also the spread, it has affected almost the entire world, and it has potential to affect almost everyone, young, gold, rich, poor. Of course, the other major difference is that the healthcare facilities those times were not as uh, say advanced as it is now. You can say that it is very primitive, it was. So now we have the technology with us on hand and to fight against the pandemic. That is the topic of our discussion today. So in this talk, I will outline the role technology is playing uh, in the fight against coronavirus. And also, I demonstrate how technologies, developers, and businesses rose to the occasion, came up with the new innovative ideas, and then uh, say, go on further in terms of, uh, say, fighting the pandemic. And also, we will look at that, what is the impact of COVID on computing and IT? Or to what extent it has affected the computing and IT services and the IT industry as well? So like any other industry, Computing and IT also got affected by COVID. Let us have a brief look at that. And then finally, let us look at what is likely to be the next normal post-COVID-19 era. So that is the uh, plan of our discussion. So the COVID crisis is a multifaceted crisis. It presented us several challenges, and also it offered us new opportunities, particularly for those in the area of computing and IT and the IT industry. And we were needed to take uh, decisions that we have not even imagined earlier. So particularly, the business managers and the executives needed to take uh, continuously assess and take quick decisions, and also implement business and operational uh, decisions that the change that changed the status quo. Basically, it is not business as usual, as you are all familiar with. We are forced to leave work and learn and socialize in a totally new environment. So we are embracing technology to address this crisis. So the world has been looking to us, the technologists, for help. And we are embracing, in many ways, uh, using uh, addressing this problem using the technology. So IT plays a central role in every activity. IT has, been a, has become an epicenter for several operations in healthcare, business, education, governance, judiciary, and name anything you like. Technology is helping companies and individuals everywhere to get through this unfortunate crisis. The good thing is that we are putting technology into use. In fact, this is a time wherein technology has put into heavy use. And also, 
as uh, the following quote says, technology has value only if you can do something useful with it. Now, many of the technological advancement, as I'll highlight in the next slide, has been uh, say, put into use, and let us see that how it is. And overnight, uh, many of the businesses and educational institutions have been digitally transformed. We have been talking about digital transformation uh, for long. And these are the two slides, images, that has been, uh, say, moving around uh, in the social media. The first one, if you look at it, who led the digital transformation of your company? Is it a chief executive officer or chief technology officer or COVID-19? And the COVID-19 has been a catalyst for the digital transformation. Although we have been talking about digital transformation of business, industry, for uh, say several years, so the COVID has made the transformation possible and made it necessary, and then we are able to get it transformed, though with some limitations within a few days or few weeks. And the other slide so image shows that digital transformation is years away. I don't see a company having to change anytime soon. And those were the mindset of many companies for long, but the COVID-19 has changed it as well. So basically, COVID has become a catalyst for the digital transformation. That is on the positive side. And as this slide shows, we are using or embracing yeah, multiple technologies. And in this slide, I have highlighted the, some of the technologies that are being put into use in the fight against uh, COVID. The cloud computing. The cloud computing, we all know about the benefits of cloud computing. We are really realizing and seeing the benefit the cloud computing offers in terms of centralized storage, access from any time, anywhere, and the ability to scale as the demand increases. And the artificial intelligence has put into uh, extensive use in the medical field, as well as in fighting the COVID in other ways. And drones and robots has become very handy in de dealing with deliveries and uh, say contacting patients remotely, so it has been put in. And telemedicine, that has got a spotlight now Though people have talked about telemedicine quite long ago, it has not got into real practice. But now, with the need to keep ourselves socially distanced, then the telemedicine is getting a renewed interest. And already, there are considerable support for telemedicine from both government as well as the medical professionals. And we have been effectively making use of the mobile services and geofencing, that is a location-based service, and chatbot, autonomous systems, virtual boards, and the internet has become an umbilical cord for all our operations, what we do, and how we live. That without the internet and the VPN, virtual private network, we would not be here doing what we are doing now without that. And we also made use of Internet of Things, IoT, uh, geographical positioning system, GPS, GIS. And the big data and big data analysts have been handy to assess the spread of the virus and then keep update on uh, how it is spreading, is a potential, uh, say, new places of outbreak and things like that. So we have also been thermal cameras, facial recognition. So as you see here, we are effectively making use of many of the recent technologies and advancements. And they're not, you're also using them in combination. That's where we get the strength. So in the next slide, three slides, I'll just summarize how it has impacted the industry and uh, what type of transformation, uh, say, it has taken place 
and the supporting technologies. As uh, most of you know, the education has been highly disrupted because of the COVID uh, pr problem. And a closure of educational institutions and access to labs restricted and uh, field work interpret and so on. So we went to the virtual learning environment. So we are using the learning management systems, e-learning, online video conferencing tools, and like that. When it comes to healthcare, this is another area where the IT has been put into significant use. Uh, we have overcrowded hospitals, and then the hospitals are unable to meet the high demand placed on them. And also, the workers, the healthcare workers, have the risk of contacting the virus from those affected by the uh, coronavirus. So here, uh, they have been transformed in uh, some ways because we have put into use certain remote uh, monitoring technologies, contact tracing, forecasting the requirement, and other areas like allotment of scared resources to patients. And this is how the IT has been put into use in the healthcare area. Uh, we have been using artificial intelligence, machine learning, cloud computing, robots, and chatbots, and other technologies in the area of healthcare. When it comes to business, uh, the, most of the businesses uh, have to remain closed or operate remotely uh, to adhere to adhere to the social distancing and then other requirements. So most of the services have gone online. And for customer service, as you would have realized, uh, many businesses use chatbots uh, to deliver the first line of services, and then they're using drone for delivery. And, and the industry, uh, where possible, they are using the robots and automation and the autonomous operations. And the stores uh, are closed, retail stores, and then we have moved to online and then online, and then the payment also, online payments, contactless payments, and so those kind of changes. And when it comes to the government, uh, many of the government services have become online. And because of uh, the various uh, changes in the job landscape, there is been spikes in demand from citizens for assistance, and it has disrupted the normal operations. Here again, the cloud and the web online meeting applications has come into picture. And even uh, the religious places have been closed, and then we are using audio and video streaming services, virtual reality, and of course the conferences, as uh, most of the conferences, in fact all the conferences have been become virtual conferences now. So as you see, so almost every industry sector has been uh, impacted by COVID. And then uh, still uh, most of them are, uh, say, continuing their services. And that is possible because we are able to put IT into use. So having given this summary, let us look at specifically in some areas what we are doing. First, let me take it up, the artificial intelligence. As I mentioned earlier, AI plays key roles in several applications. One is in predicting the places of outbreaks so that we can prepare for managing the uh, potential uh, patients who are affected by the COVID-19. And tracing patients and warn about the disease spread. And uh, patient tracing is a very successful and very widely used operation and it has been used almost on most of the countries. I will also highlight in a subsequent slide later. And also the outline treatment priorities and other interventions. And as, for, as hospitals are overcrowded, and then they are, uh, the facilities are not good enough to meet all the demands, the treatment has to be prioritized. And how do you prioritize treatment? Uh, some of the hospitals are using AI-based systems to prioritize the treatment and uh, allotment of resources for the potential patient. And uh, in some applications, AI also being used to maintain the social order and social distancing. And uh, people have come up with, uh, say, novel applications 
to deny whether a person wears a mask. In some countries, uh, it is mandatory to wear a mask, face mask, when you go out. So there are uh, surveillance cameras, and then they take the image from surveillance cameras and then detect whether a person is wears a mask. And then uh, say, if they don't, then it sends a uh, sort of indication to the uh, say uh, the authorities who are supposed to monitor and take action. And also it is used for diagnosis very well, and particularly getting a quick, uh, say, a response or a quick results from x-rays and so on. And also there has been a lot in the government as well as the healthcare, uh, say, management agencies. They have a large dashboards and then they get a quick analysis and also it issues travel alerts and other precautions. So AI has been put into use, uh, heavy use, as you see here in a number of ways. Uh, and also, besides those uh, areas, and as you see in this slide, uh, virtual reality applications also has been put into use, medical use. I'll uh, deal with that later. And the other area is that AI put into use is the new drug development. As you all are aware, now uh, there are many groups, research groups in different countries are looking for vaccine and are working very seriously. And the AI also is put into use to towards new drug development. And Another area that the AI has been being put into use is for testing. So coronavirus test. Currently, there are a lot of uh, say, demands for testing the people, whether they have a coronavirus or not. And then the test kits are in shortage. So the engineers and computer scientists came up with an algorithmic-based approach to supercharge COVID testing, it's called as pool testing. And basically it uses algorithm and then the test samples and then to have a yeah, quick results so that we can identify who are the, uh, those who are affected by it. And uh, in the ITB spectrum, there is a recent article on that. So in most of my slides, I have provided the hyperlink so you can uh, look at the hyperlink for details. So this is a new development. So basically to speed up testing with the, where there is a shortage of uh, kids survey. And having uh, experienced the role of AI and its significance, then there is a expectation that the COVID-19 will accelerate the AI in the healthcare post after COVID. The reasons are the following. What promotes the acceleration is the following. One is the availability of large machine accessible data sets. So during the last say three, four months, we have collected a large volume of data about the patients, their uh, say, uh, profile, where they are located, and so on and so forth. And that large set of data can be used to train the, uh, say, AI machine learning systems. And also, uh, because of the COVID, there has been increased collaboration among computing professionals as well as health professionals in an effort to address this problem. And also, there is international cooperation and information sharing. As a result of this, there is the expectation that the role of AI in healthcare will increase in the coming years. And uh, according to uh, Gartner finding, by 2023, in about, say, two to three years' time, 20% of all patient interaction will involve some form of AI enablement, particularly both in our clinical as well as non-clinical processes. Currently, according to the estimates, only 4% of the interactions uh, uh, say use some form of AI that is likely to go up in the future. So that is uh, as far as the AI is concerned. As I mentioned earlier, the telemedicine 
is in the spotlight now. Patients today are enjoying the freedom of seeing the doctors and getting the medication and uh, getting the diagnosis where possible over smartphone, tablets, and home computers. Though the concept of telemedicine is known and promoted earlier, so we didn't take up well. There was not much support either from the doctors or from the patients. Now the COVID has become a, some trigger and now the telehealth is being used in several countries now and particularly more so in Australia, the government supports it and then all the stockholders, stakeholders uh, try to uh, make use of the telehealth uh, opportunities where feasible. And the contact tracing application, uh, say, has been used in many countries, particularly in the East Asia, and it has been a good, in, good a impact in flattening the curve. The key is the aggressive application of mobile tracking applications. In some countries, it is voluntary. In some countries, it has been mandatory. And it has been quite successful in, uh, say, monitoring the spread and also the potential people who had been in contact with the patient who had the coronavirus. So it is one of the uh, most widely used uh, mobile applications worldwide. And then uh, there are other, uh, say, applications as well. One is the voice assistance. And though we had know about Alexa, Siri, and others, uh, now they have put into a newer use. Say, for example, Amazon Alexa voice assistant now can answer questions such as whether I have a symptoms of COVID or do I need to get tested with COVID. In this case, what happens is that it asks for some information, like the patient's uh, symptoms, history, travel history, and possibly exposure to someone else who might be infected with the disease, and then comes up with a response where they should, they should get tested, whether there is any possibility of they being get up. So just a uh, voice assistance analyzes the, uh, uh, say the user's uh, symptoms and other information, and then comes up with a first time whether there is a possibility of them. And similarly, uh, the Siri has uh, also updated their uh, say, uh, application. It also does the similar thing. And the uh, same is the Microsoft and uh, CDC has come up with a new bot called Calera, which also does the same. So basically, it helps in initial because there is a lot of uh, pressure to get people get tested and then the testing capabilities are limited and this is one way that initial screening can be done so this is not perfect this is just a initial uh, say screen and also it a voice assistant has been put into use in the customer service and other areas where now some of the initial consultation the say inquiries in businesses and government, it's also done by voice assistants. And robots, they are unsung heroes during the crisis. They have been put into use for everything from like disinfecting hospitals and uh, say walking the stage for the graduation. So since the universities are closed, and how do you conduct the uh, graduation? You might have seen in the uh, popular media videos and other news items that uh, the, uh, the degrees offered to the uh, graduates uh, using robots, robots walks through, and then the presenter gives the award, and then the robot carries a photograph of the person uh, who is supposed to receive it in remotely. So from those kind of application to more serious applications in hospital for disinfecting and other uh, delivery, the robots has been put into use. If you see on this slide, uh, you can see the two images, one on the top and the another at the bottom. The top one is a new development from a Swiss startup. Uh, it's called, it is used for uh, disinfecting 
offices. And this particular robot is highly versatile. It can move up and down on the staircases and then uh, say move anywhere. And good thing about it is that it has a lidar and then other sensors. It can identify the surfaces that would have been, say, the human would have touched. So basically, it looks for touch, uh, surfaces that are potential for coronavirus infection, and then disinfects only those parts, like desktops, uh, counters, handles, handrails, and the equipments in common use, like fridge. So it is a very novel development that uses the machine vision and uh, robotics, and then it is completely autonomous. And another robot, what you see in the bottom, is from Boston Dynamics. Basically, it helps the frontline health workers. Basically, the frontline health workers are at risk uh, in contacting and then dealing with the coronavirus patients. So basically, these robots, what it does is that rather than the healthcare workers, frontline healthcare workers directly meeting the patients and then getting some relevant information and doing what is need to be done for them as an initial stage, these uh, robots can walk and then it has get the all the so initial information and also monitor certain parameters from the patients and then also deliver certain goods or the medication as well. So basically, you can consider it as a mobile uh, healthcare worker. So basically, the objective is that to reduce the risk of uh, frontline healthcare workers getting affected. So it has also been put into use. And this slide uh, shows a number of other applications uh, in several areas. The first one is the public safety. So quarantine enforcement in some countries, they are using robots to enforce the uh, social distancing and they enforce the quarantine and to identify if uh, some places are completely locked down and the robots uh, roam around the roads and then find out whether someone is uh, say moving around where they are not supposed to do and disinfecting public places and so on. And also, uh, we have seen how they are put into the clinical areas. And also, robots are used uh, for, uh, say, delivering food in, uh, say, heavily infected patients are located. And in the industrial sector, it is used for, uh, say, delivery, contact list delivery, as well as, uh, say, the uh, in production of critical infrastructure. And it has been used. And even in non-hospital areas, where the delivery to patients who are quarantined uh, in some countries. Now, when you uh, go from one country to other country, then you are required to be quarantined for 14 days. So how do you, they are, where there are potential that those patients, those people might have got affected by COVID. So they are using a robot for delivering food, medicines, and other essentials. So that way, robots has been put into use are in a more effective and way. So here is the other technology that I just briefly mentioned, virtual reality. Though we talked about the virtual reality and then the uh, say potential of it is known, now it has been put into use uh, both in the clinical area as well as in the non-clinical area. So in the clinical area, it is empowering doctors and care, care, care providers. But in other areas, like uh, say now, since most of the travel is uh, so prohibited, now people, how do you engage? How do you spend time? So you can use the work global exploration using virtual reality. There are uh, some new applications have come up. So if you want to go and see Paris, you can do virtually and uh, using a virtual reality handset and the appropriate application. I have given here in the slide a number of uh, links to further information. You can look at that. So virtual reality with the headset. Though the headset, virtual reality headset is not, uh, uh, say, very cheap, so it can be still put into use. So this is the virtual reality applications. And gaming. And that has had a renewed interest since most people are 
children as well as others that we locked down uh, in the home. Then the online gaming got a renewed interest as well. So this is on the lighter side of technological application. So this particular one uh, is about the gaming for hospital staff. The hospital staff are, uh, say, overworked, tired, and then they need some relaxation. So what some uh, government have done is uh, they have made some games uh, exclusively for healthcare workers. This is the example of National Health Service in UK. Uh, they made available certain games exclusively for the healthcare workers. This is another way of how the technology is helping to the healthcare workers. And deliveries, these are all autonomous vehicles. And as, as I said, the certain essential services need to be carried out, and uh, say delivery vans, autonomous delivery vans, and drones are being put into use for supplying the food, medicines, and other items. And here is another technology that has been put into use, that is 3D printing or three-dimensional printing. And during this crisis, uh, there is a shortage of, uh, say, masks, ventilators, and other uh, clinical, uh, say, gadgets uh, because of the sudden demand. So how do you get those uh, supplies made? So people have used 3D, uh, three-dimensional 3D, 3D printers to make masks, ventilators, and shields, et cetera, where it is required with quickly. The advantage of 3D printing is that you can get it printed or get it made, manufactured on demand, uh, to on demand, and also it can allow customizations. So they have been put into use in a number of ways. And one particular uh, uh, so example I want to highlight is that uh, the ventilators, usually they support one, uh, say, one patient, one ventilator for one patient. Yeah, actually, Sudanese engineer uh, developed a ventilator that uses a recycled air that can support up to 20 patients concurrently. This is a novel, uh, say, application. It is a innovation that. So 3D printing also has been put into use. And of course, uh, as you all know, because of the uh, coronavirus, and uh, there has been panic buying. And the stores, uh, the toilet papers were out, and the other essential, like pasta and other things, there have been high demand, and then stores were without the goods. So here comes the how do you manage the supply chain? There have been sudden uh, rise in demand for certain kind of, uh, say, goods. So the uh, the supply chain management system also has been uh, geared up to address that and so that they can move and deliver the goods to the uh, places where in demands that also has been put in. And the another area where that has been completely transformed is the workplace. The most of the workplaces have been transformed from an campus or in office work to remote work. And within just two months, uh, the COVID has made possible what uh, the, trans the previously talked about transmission could not be done. So the, even in the industry, they use virtual assistants, robotic process automation, and uh, other uh, virtual meeting services. So the workplace has been transformed. And uh, the workplace transformation seems to be not just only for the during this period, it is likely to continue forever. So the many major companies have already announced that uh, many of their workers will work from uh, home or remotely. And uh, so that has a permanent impact. And uh, so the technology is helping to do that. So having seen that applications of uh, IT in our effort to fight the wire crisis, now let us look at what the impact it has caused on computing the IT. So in the next few slides, I will highlight uh, some of the impacts and how here we have managed that. 
Uh, the, when you look at the impact on IT and computing, largely it has been positive. So there have been some new business innovations, startup have, have come up with uh, new applications. And uh, the, the competitive also has been a very positive competition, meaning that people are coming up with uh, new products and services quickly. And uh, the new business models have emerged. And then there has been increased collaboration among the businesses itself uh, to come together to come up with uh, new applications. Often cited example of that is that uh, the tra uh, patient tracing applications uh, developed by Google and Apple together, the, the, some of the employees, they came together and collaboratively worked out a, a new uh, patient tracing application. So that is on the positive side. And also it has uh, given a boost to IT. And there are also some negative impacts as well, which I'll discuss uh, subsequently. One is the increased uh, security threats. The security threats have increased uh, during the last two, three months and uh, in the wake of coronavirus. And there have been some performance issues due to significantly increased workload, which I'll also discuss that. And then the business continuity and agility issues uh, they are there in some cases that are uh, some, some of the negative impacts. And the pandemic also exposed the weaknesses and vulnerabilities of IT systems in business and government. So the vulnerabilities were there, it was not exposed, that severity has not felt. So the coronavirus has exposed those weaknesses so that it will help uh, in fixing them in the coming months and years. So as a result of all this application, there has been tremendous increase on demand for IT services because of the remote work, online applications, virtual meetings and streaming services, the increase in online entertainment and gaming services, there has been a massive increase in the traffic and the workload. So how did ID handle that? By far, it has handled uh, very satisfactorily. There have not been a major, uh, say, uh, down or breakup in the IT services. And the cloud computing, they were able to scale and then meet the demand. So that has been basically the cloud and the internet were able to meet the increased demand, they were able to scale it, that is on the positive side. And the COVID has also become a true stress test for all our IT systems, whether it's the server, cloud, the internet, mobile communication. So basically it has become a end-to-end -end stress test for all our IT systems. And it's also became a stress test for healthcare systems, logistics, government agencies, so on and so forth. As regards the computing and IT, so it has been highly stress test, including for security aspects as well. And this is the uh, an article from Washington Post. So about the how the internet we stood. Your internet is working thanks to this cold war era pioneers who designed it to handle almost anything. As you, we all know, it was intended for a yes, uh, very narrow purpose. Now, with all this increasing, the internet are able to cope up with and able to service it well. That shows its uh, resiliency. And business continuity, agility is an area uh, that has uh, say successfully managed uh, because the hardware and software were able to uh, to modify to accommodate the transformation, digital transformation within a short time. However, uh, there has been uh, some setbacks as well. Uh, so many government agencies needed to modify their uh, system to accommodate, uh, say, the uh, unemployment payment or to take up certain, uh, so provide benefits to the citizens. But they were unable to do it in a quick time. 
The one of the reason is that the systems they had uh, has not, not easily updated. They had a legacy system, luckily hardware, legacy software, they were unable to operate. And in com some countries where the systems have been, uh, say, reasonably updated, and they were able to get it done quickly, and where they already have uh, digitally transformed, they were able to update it much more quickly than the others. So that shows that the need for keeping the IT systems uh, say current and easily updatable. And in the context of the US and many of the software uh, still remains in the global COBOL language, which is about 50 years old. So they had a shortage of people who can update the COBOL programs to support the payment for uh, sub process un unemployment claims and so forth. So that shows the need for keeping the IT systems current and easily updatable. That is another lesson that we have. As I mentioned, the security has been another area. There has been a lot of uh, security threats, increased security threats in the last few months, exploiting the confusion and fear surrounding the people and the employees. So basically, uh, the those with malicious intent, they exploit the human uh, psychology they are masterful at playing at the human emotions. Because there has been considerable confusion about the coronavirus, what it is, how it is uh, in fact, what we can do and all that. And uh, exploiting that confusion and the fear surrounding the people, uh, so there have been increased cyber attacks, primarily in terms of the phishing mails, malicious applications, as well as attacks on information systems and websites are uh, basically giving a wrong information and slowing the servers. Those are the increased attacks on cyber. And another problem is that false information. There has been considerable increase in the false information and hate messages as well as defects videos. Here again, uh, the, the technology has been uh, both acted uh, both in positive sense as well as in the negative sense. The technology was able to spread the false information much more quickly via social media. And there have been so much of false information and uh, say uh, the uh, wrong advice and the World Health Organization called, the term, called it as infodemics. That is a over supply or over, uh, uh, say, uh, circulation of false information that is not good. So that also need to be addressed. Now the Facebook and others have come up with uh, some measures, some of which are based on AI, how to identify false information and then how to prevent the spread of the false information. And there have been, uh, some of you might have read about the conspiracy theories one of the conspiracy theories related to the coronavirus is related to the technology that is coronavirus and 5G technology. Uh, there were uh, say incorrect information passing around the social media that 5G, uh, say mobile communication technology, accelerates the spread of the coronavirus or intensifies its, uh, say, uh, its vitality. So that was the false information of the conspiracy theories at point. And because of that, in the uh, UK, 10, uh, say, mobile towers have been destroyed by arsonists, just because spreading yeah, false information and uh, conspiracy theories supporting that. And the sad part is that uh, some of the, uh, say, uh, well-known people, they have also uh, circulated the same false information through their social media, social media, Instagram and uh, Facebook and other accounts. And many people thought that that is true and then they are concerned about it. And that led to some few problems. There are also certain pseudoscience and as reported in the Nature magazine saying that uh, say cocaine will uh, say will cure the COVID and so on. So there is a considerable false information that was passed on. So that is the other side of the story, the impact on it. And I would like to bring to your attention uh, a recent article 
that appeared in the communications of the ACM, uh, written by Professor Gordy. Uh, basically, what it says is that uh, they want the there is a need for resilience because in the, over the years, when we talked about the algorithms, when we developed the algorithms, we have the more focus has been on only the computational efficiency in terms of the time it takes, the memory it uses. And the COVID has uh, say, made us to think that that's not good enough. We also need to look into the other aspects like fault tolerance, security, and that should be pushed down to the algorithmic level. That's what he calls as a, the need for resilient algorithms. And it's a short one-page article, just it uh, brings to the attention that the competing professionals and uh, educationists that uh, we need to focus in the algorithm development, not just only the computational efficiency, we also need to take into account the other factors. And uh, so the coronavirus also exposed certain, uh, say, uh, it has also cautioned us to take into account the data that we use for training the AI or training the machine learning algorithms. During the, because machine learning algorithms use the data set that we have. But during the coronavirus, what happened is that there has been, let's say for example, panic buying. There have been a sudden rush for uh, say healthcare services. So the data we had, it is not uh, supporting the reality. So there has been a need to modify certain machine learning model because this has been abnormal behavior. So in the case of buying, in the case of customer demands, there's been a sudden unpaving. So that has resulted in some of the AI decisions. Uh, so need to be corrected to make account for the situations. And when it comes to the other on the positive side, and as reported in, a, uh, say, The Economist magazine, there has been flood of uh, free flow of information about the coronavirus and the, what are the developments that are taking place, maybe new vaccine development, and in many areas, how the business have transformed. So there have been so many research papers uh, that has been published in the last few months. The chart shows sudden increase in the number of papers. That's a good sign. And also there is a collaboration, free flow of information sharing. And uh, as many of you may be aware, the IEEE, in association with other societies, has put up a very comprehensive, uh, I uh, say, resource uh, on COVID-19 and how the IEEE members are working on developing technologies to assist with that. It is a good collection of uh, articles and it is being frequently updated. For those who are not familiar with that, I strongly recommend to have a look at it. Yes. And it's a good initiative by IEEE and other societies to make it available free most of the information. So next uh, the couple of minutes, let us look at what is ahead of us. What would be likely to be the uh, post-COVID era and how it would uh, impact the IT and the IT professionals. The one thing that has become very clear is that pandemic has accelerated changes and transformations. What could not have been achieved in the past few years we were able to change and get it transformed within days and weeks. And things have changed in profound ways. So this is one example. The webinars, now the webinars have been everywhere. The conferences have become virtual and we are working from home. And the, the changes has been profound. It also shows that we have been very adoptive as well. The, our mindset has changed. The people who are objected to or reluctant to the transformation or digitalization now forced to accept it, and then they have accepted it. So there has been a change in the mindset in the adaptation of the technology. 
So we'll be moving to a new world and new opportunities will arise. There will be a new lifestyle or new issues and challenges we'll also face. And it will be a, what uh, we call as a VUCA word. Business people, for, the, for those who are from the business area, the term would be very familiar. VUCA stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. The world will be so sort of some sort of uncertain, volatile, and uncertain. And then it will be more increasingly complex as well. But it will be both exciting as well as scary. And we need to get ready to face it. And there are not many other options. So the, the challenge is that how you are going to manage that. And here I highlighted a few technology trends that will get a boost in the coming years or the post-COVID era. One is the business continuity planning. Now the COVID has uh, sort of uh, given a lesson to the business that they need to focus on the business continuity planning, how to plan for security outage, power failures, natural disasters, and new pandemics if it is any in the future. So that will gain a higher priority. And the resilience, the ability to continuously make the systems available and then for support workforce mobility and those things will increase. And there will be more push for uh, the moving to cloud, either a private cloud or the public cloud because of its scalability and the ability to access application data from anywhere, there will be increased push towards cloud. And the analytics uh, will have assume the higher, uh, say, uh, requirement and more, more so also AI and automation and uh, many systems will be made autonomous where possible. And sub cyber security will assume a further uh, say demand in terms of how do you address new threats, increased threats and so on. And privacy uh, will get a new light because there has been, as uh, I highlighted in the following slide, there has been some tension between, uh, say, people and the applications that has been put into use, particularly the contact tracing applications. So the privacy also need to be relooked into. There will be a digital acceleration in terms of uh, push to new business models, and so on. So basically, there will be a uh, say increased. Uh, demand for IT, and as a result, the IT industry also need to change. And uh, one is that move towards a flexible operation and applications. The other is the flexibility in its operation. And then, the more importantly, network-wide stress testing. Uh, the COVID has uh, made us to think how we stress test our systems. And uh, most of the stress test is all piecemeal basis. Instead, there will be a uh, call for network-wide and end-to-end -end security test, uh, end-to-end -end testing, stress testing of our systems. And IT will become mission critical. Already it's mission critical many applications. In the future, it will become a central piece and then it will become much more important. Uh, this is the one thing just I wanted to highlight. Uh, because when uh, the applications collects a lot of information about the people, their location, and who have been in contact with others, and there is a lot of privacy implications. And most of the privacy policies have been developed uh, under certain assumptions. And those assumptions are not valid or not uh, say fully valid during the crisis time. So how do you address that? So IEEE, Global Initiative on Ethics of Autonomous Systems, have come up with uh, some addressed ten issues and have come up with certain, uh, say, guidelines. For those who are interested in, can look at it. I have given the guideline there. And also, a few months ago, 
uh, iteratively has come up with a thickly aligned design. So when we design and develop systems, how do we take into account the ethical guidelines? That it, so that's also our responsibility to make sure that we follow the ethical guidelines. So research and development will have a boost. And uh, most of the research and development will be focused on addressing the real world problems and issues. And there has been uh, so pressure from the funding agencies to address the real world problems and the people problems we face now and we are likely to face in the future. So call for doing responsible research and developments that the uh, demand for that will increase in the future. And as I said there earlier, technology has value only if you can do something useful to it that and the coronavirus has reinforced the call for such kind of activities in the future. And basically, uh, the most of the work will be multidisciplinary in nature, and then uh, there will be a lot more uh, work will continue on autonomous system, data analytics, robotics, supply chain management, healthcare, and the other allied areas. And we may to develop and adopt new mindset as uh, Apple co-founder Steve Jobs said, we may need to think differently, not the business as usual. So we need to think ahead and then with a new mindset. Next, I'll bring to your attention uh, a quote by Bill Gates. And I want to point out two things here. When you said, Um, Bill Gates gave a talk, TED Talk, in 2015. Then he talked about the next pandemic, whether we are ready to handle it. About five years ago, he has certain ideas, but uh, no one took it seriously. And then we are in a situation where we are now. So it is worth listening to the talk. And then, uh, so after the outbreak of coronavirus, uh, see, in the month of April, he wrote an article in The Economist. This is what he said in that article. When historians write the books on the COVID-19 pandemic, what we have lived through so far will probably take up only the first third of the book, first third or so. The bulk of the story will be what happens next. Basically, what it implied, he implied is that the post-COVID transformation and the impact will be significant and will change the livelihood of the people and the history of what follows. That's what he wanted to imply it, and that's what we will face as well. So the life post-COVID will not be the same as what it was. It will be entirely different. And as uh, Winston Churchill said, we should never waste a crisis. Crisis is an opportunity to change and change quicker. And COVID has demonstrated that, then basically it has taught us a lesson. Those specifics cannot be foreseen of what would be, uh, say, in the next few years. So the flexibility, adaptability are critical. So with that, and when you want to plan for post-COVID-19 era, we can need to keep certain things in mind. One is that necessity is the mother of invention. So when you look at some of the applications, you can see that because there was a need, then we came up with some new innovative applications that it reinforces the saying that necessity is the mother of invention. So when there is a problem, people have come up and then collaborated together, come up with new innovative products and services. Our life pro-corona and post-corona will not be the same. It is different and it won't be the business as usual. And one thing uh, that history has shown is that whenever a uh, crisis was there, 
The crisis might have been a temporary, but the impact has had a permanent, uh, say, uh, permanent change. And it has uh, several studies uh, shows that it has reshaped the, our beliefs and behaviors as well. And I think the COVID will do the same as well. So our mindset will change. So IT will play even more major and crucial roles in the post-COVID era, so as the role of computer scientists and IT professionals and developers and the IT industry as well. Though IT industry may face a downturn in terms of the revenue for a short time following the coronavirus, COVID-19, but in the long term, so it will likely to have a bright future. So with it, I would like to uh, bring to a conclusion and we can take up a few questions if there is any. So basically, uh, the IT has uh, served its purpose and then it has been put into use. It has helped in fighting the uh, say, an uh, invisible enemy that we have and it has helped us to manage the crisis uh, reasonably well. So with that, uh, I would like to uh, conclude my formal presentation. Uh, if there is any questions, I'll now hand over to Kerry. Yeah, thank you. Um, we do have a few questions coming in, and if uh, anybody else has any questions, feel free to put those in the Q&A. The first question we have is, what is your opinion about partly or completely locked down uh, of societies or a country? Uh, so basically, I think that uh, it depends upon uh, the how the uh, virus spread. And in places where they had a complete lockdown, uh, so as far my understanding is concerned, they were able to contain the spread and then bring back to normalcy, uh, say, sooner. So a yeah, case in example is the Australia as well as a few countries. So I think it depends upon uh, the profile and then where the people are located, what they are doing, and how they interact. And I think there is no clear answer uh, whether which one is right. And But at the same time, there is call for balancing the lockdown, the impact of lockdown with the, uh, the economic. So they say that we need to be balanced. So life and livelihood has to be balanced. That's why the, some of the governments are facing the challenge as well. So just a short answer is that it depends and there is no clear cut answer. And also I don't have a really clear, clear cut uh, say answer, yes or no answer to that. It needs to be analyzed. Okay, very good. One audience member has said, COVID-19 exposes general issues in scale e.g. PPE slash test provision, and systemic uh, interoperability, e.g. transportable common medical records. Might you comment on scale and interoper interoperability with regard to future affordable health care initiatives? I think that there will be a lot more uh, to call for making the system interoperable. So I'm talking in terms of the computing IT systems, and as the say the uh, participant has pointed out, uh, there has there are uh, difficulties in making the system interoperable. I think that there may be uh, say new regulations that make it uh, certain healthcare uh, applications interoperable, data shareable as well. So I think that is an area that will gain a uh, further impetus and importance. Okay, and we may have certain Sorry. new regulations, uh, at least uh, say nationwide as well as the global as well. And I think that people will look at from that angle. Okay, very good. Um, another audience member has asked, is the work from home a result of the COVID-19 event or a pull ahead of the trends that were already going. The organizations have transitioned very quickly and were more planned um, and ready to do so versus a new initiative. 
I think uh, we had the technology to for the remote work, but the stakeholders were reluctant. Even the businesses were not sure, at least many of the businesses are not sure how it will work, whether there is, what are the risks. And then there were uh, CEOs and his CTOs also were reluctant. So as I mentioned in my uh, say talk, the COVID has become a catalyst. So it has forced them to experiment. So basically we have experimented the uh, remote work uh, concept uh, much more intensively. There may have been some difficulties in the transition and uh, partly it would have been uh, say, uh, ironed out. So I think that uh, basically it has changed the mindset of the executives and probably the mindset of the workers as well. But the work from remote, uh, say remote work, has also has some negative sides that need to be looked into. Uh, basically, what is the impact it would have on the society? I read an article in the Weird Map, say magazine, that it would have a serious impact on the society as you know it. For example, if you work, go to work, you go to work and mingle with the colleagues and then discuss with them, go to the coffee shop and then the business, transportation, the whole ecosystem is there when you go to uh, the on campus works, when people move around and then discuss. And then when it comes to the work from home permanently, then these, the status quo is changed. It will have a implications that need to be studied. So that is my answer to that. I think that COVID has accelerated the transformation to the remote work. And having seen uh, the businesses, seen the benefits of it in terms of the economy, and uh, the businesses are very keen to continue that for, for where possible, but it would have implications as well in terms of other areas, and that probably need to be addressed as something new that what would it be if most of the businesses go into a remote work mode, what implications it would have on the society and the rest of the businesses is uh, yet to be studied. Okay, thank you. Um, another audience member says, can you please comment on the new cybersecurity measure currently being addressed since more and more sensitive information is now being delivered via IT? Um, especially the downside of all of this transition? Uh, I think that uh, there will be, a, there is a lot of informa uh, uh, information shared, but I think that uh, still uh, people want to keep uh, IP rights with them. And uh, so basically we may get into the area, so we share certain information but still some will be protected. I think that's what, as far as the, the vaccine development and other things will go on. And also there is call for, uh, particularly in the context of uh, vaccine, there is call for making the vaccine, no matter who develops it, make it as a public good. So that means that anyone can use it as far as that. And as far as the other area is concerned, the privacy, and uh, there will be uh, some changes in the privacy regulations in the future in terms of what information can be accessed and who can be shared, particularly in the time of crisis. Say, for example, uh, the, uh, the contact tracing applications, uh, say many of the countries, the contact tracing information is gathered via the mobile phone, but that information is kept only for 20 days or 20 or uh, something like that, 20 days. And after that, that data is automatically deleted. So there will be some, uh, say, balancing need to be done in terms of the, uh, say, how do you manage the data that we need and also how do you balance with the privacy and then the personal information that you need to be collected. I think there need to be some rethink on that and uh, so as such, there is no clear answer to that. Thank you. This next one is more of a, a, a comment uh, regarding the statement you made earlier about how humans' behavior is causing problems for the 
uh, the machine learning algorithms or the, the AI. They state that um, machine learning algorithms are okay for interpolation, but not useful for extrapolation or explanation. Is there anything you'd like to say as comment to that statement? Yes, uh, actually the, the point is valid as regards the uh, explanation uh, that is a limitation of the machine learning algorithm. Now people are uh, researching how do you make it more uh, say visible? So the concept of explainability, explainability is coming into the picture. And uh, so we want, we would like to know why a machine learning algorithm came up with a particular decision or particular uh, say guideline. So we would like to know. And that is an area something uh, that is, uh, some people are working on it, but we have not reached anything uh, stage wherein we can say that uh, machine learning algorithms can explain uh, the, how he has arrived at a decision. As regards the extrapolation, uh, basically it is based on certain assumptions. If the assumptions uh, changes either due to certain unexpected events, then basically the extrapolations will fail. So a classic example is the COVID. Say for example, uh, you anticipate demand in a store during say summer time. And because of the sudden uh, changes in the demand, sudden changes, external changes, that forecast is obviously going to be uh, say weird. So basically that also need to be looked into account. So on what assumptions that systems were developed and when the circumstances changes, then it need to be relooked into retrained. Thank you. Uh, this next question says, uh, one critical exposure of COVID-19's impact has been on global supply chain sourcing, not just for IT, but all other sectors. How do you see this changing on a go-forward basis? Um, so I think it's an evolving area. And uh, so it, it will get evolved, but we don't know sure that to what way it will go forward. Okay. So we can move to the next question. Yes, we have the, the next one. Uh, you've been living through this in Australia and you may still have many connections to India. What, if anything, can others learn from the government and society reactions in those areas? I think the society reaction has uh, primarily been positive because of the deadly impact the virus could have. But at the same time, there are also been concern about the negative impact of these lockdowns and some of these measures in terms of the business impact, in terms of the impact on the economy. So I think that, as I mentioned earlier, uh, to people are, are receptive and uh, say, are buying some of their uh, say, uh, constraints and then they are going to live with the constraints. But then at the same time, they would like to see that we move forward and then we don't get stuck with this uh, say lockdown and the limitations. And so is the case with the businesses as well. Everyone want to come back to the normality as soon as possible. But how soon? That's the question. And I believe that's our last question. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Murugasyan, Gurasan, for your presentation today. Um, I'd also like to thank all of the people here who have attended this uh, presentation. In addition to the Distinguished Lecturer webinar series, we also offer the Build Your Career webinar series that focuses on business soft skills, such as communication, presentation skills, career transition, interviewing tips, among others. The next webinar in the Distinguished Lecturer webinar series, the one we're on here, uh, will be on the 27th of May at 5.30 a.m. U.S. Eastern Time, 7.30 p.m. Sydney Time. Chin Tan, Australia's Race Discrimination Commissioner at the Australian Human Rights Commission, 
Dr. Andre Obler, CEO of the Online Hate Prevention Institute, and Dr. James Gomez, Regional Director of the Asia Center, will discuss online racism in the coronavirus crisis. Amlan Chakrabarty's webinar on machine learning for med medical imaging analysis demystified that was scheduled for May 28th has been rescheduled for the 10th of June at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Dr. Chakrabarty is a professor at the University of Calcutta. On the 11th of June at 11 a.m. U.S. Eastern Time, Katarzyna Obak will cover quantifying the quality of life of smartphone-centric humans via human-centric methods. And our next Build Your Career webinar will be on the 18th of June at 11 a.m. Eastern Time on what everybody is saying. This is presented by Elsa Velasco Paul, founder of the m and Group. Registration is now open and we'll be sending you a link to these future events along with slides and the recording of this webinar. Again, Dr. Muragasem, thank you very much for your time in this presentation. It was great and it applies to everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kerry and his team and the participants. Thank you.